Um, there you go. This lecture is being recorded. Um, Curtis, uh, thank you, um, Tom, for agreeing to do that. And it will be posted on the Archaeological uh, Institute of America's um, YouTube site. So there is the um, link, and I'm happy to send that to anyone after the lecture if you don't have a chance to write that down. Tom Paradise is a geosciences professor and the former director of the King Fahd Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Arkansas. He comes from a diverse background in the environmental sciences, architectural and historic material preservation, um, Middle East, Mediterranean and North Africa regional studies and cartography GIS. Um, he's researched at um, Petra Jordan since 1990. He'll tell us more about that. And he has published more than 60 articles, reports, and chapters on Petra and continues to advise US and foreign agencies on cultural heritage management and architectural deterioration, Mediterranean and Middle East architecture and geographic visualization and cartography. Um, he has published more than 2,000, whoops, yeah, 2,000 maps for agencies, authors, publishers, TV networks, and corporations. Here's a fun thing. He's been a script and graphics consultant to a number of documentary productions, including NOVA, um, National Geographic, Discovery, and the Smithsonian Channels. Some of you may have seen his, I, I had seen it, and I didn't realize I didn't put two and two together until just a few days ago. Um, the PBS Nova special Petra, Lost City of Stone, it came out in 2060, and that's one of PBS's highest rated specials ever. He has also been the cartographer and author of the award-winning Atlas Hawaii and the popular student atlases of Hawaii and Arkansas and Illustrated Atlas. And finally, he is a certified gemologist um, in the US and the United Kingdom. He is a Fulbright senior, he was a Fulbright senior scholar in Jordan, and he's taught abroad in Rome, Oman, Venice, and Tunisia, and Tunis, as well as in the US, in Georgia, Hawaii, Arizona, California, and Arkansas. That's the short version. <laughs> um, anyway, he is pleased, I'm so pleased that he's going to talk to us today about the Lost Valley of the Crescent Moon. 30 years of research in Petra, Jordan. And just give us a minute to switch um, technologies here. Okay, Tom, it's on you. We good? Is that it? That's it. Oh, we are so good. Thank you, Dr. Hirschfeld. This is so exciting. This is, I mean, this is like speaking, talking about your kids or something. This is so exciting to me. It's been my second home for 32 years. <laughs> Um, and I'm just so delighted that over the years I've actually right, been able to write about my great time discoveries and, of course, um, students that have done amazing work with me over the years. So I'm going to go through the slides and talk to you about basically 30 years of research in Petra. And it'll start off a little sciency, and then it's going to become broader and much more comprehensive because I started to work there. Um, actually working on my dissertation that was quite, quite obtuse in the field of deterioration. And then um, we'll bring it up to the present um, with more comprehensive work and then finishing up with the complications, unexpected surprises, uh, being an academic and suddenly being thrust into the world of Hollywood and working on film, which is just so bizarre, so weird. Okay, so let's jump in the deep end. I'm gonna go a little quickly because I have 30 years of research. I'm gonna talk about five distinct projects um, over the years, and then we'll finish with um, some of the Hollywoody stuff. So when we talk about Petra, we tend to think of it as this amazing empire kingdom that was existing about 500 um, BCE to about 500 AD. But we have archeological evidence that takes it back to an easy 3000 BCE. But the real, the real point of Petra really starts at about the time of Moses. And we'll talk about that. So when we really talk about Petra's beginnings, we talk about 1250 BC, um, and then the period that we think of at about the time of um, uh, the, the spread of the Greco-Roman empires. 
These are just some early photographs to give you an idea of the mirror, the simple scale of Petra. When we talk about Petra, Petra was, we see Petra now is this amazing place with these large hewn buildings. This building you're looking at in front of you, in front of you is called the monastery. A lot of tourists don't ever see this. It's out of the valley about two miles. But you can see from the scale of the people climbing around on the top who aren't supposed to be up there. This is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And that's a no-no, um, obviously, to climb around on these. And they've done some great damage over the years, tourists and different people climbing up. But I want you to see the scale. If these people are five to six feet, you can see that this is a structure that was carved out of the cliff face and exceeds 200 feet in height. It's really quite extraordinary. And we'll talk more about the architectural styles that really make this building quite different than the most famous of the buildings, the treasury that we'll talk about in a minute. And my finished slide tonight also talks about the monastery. So this is the building that kind of um, starts it all and it was intentional for the Nabataeans to place it where it is. And we'll talk about this in a minute, but it really, it really um, affected radically the the creation of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade in using this building for the final scenes of, the, of that whole epic. Um, it also started my work in Petra because I happened to be there looking for a dissertation site and I was hired by UNESCO for three days to be the custodian um, of the site while they were filming. And so that was super exciting to me as a grad student, right? Being able to meet Sean Connery and Harrison Ford and all these guys, Steven Spielberg and the Queen of Jordan was there, Queen Noor at the time. And all of that's going on at the time in 1989 when this is being filmed. And so I fell in love with Petra and have worked there ever since, 1990 being my first summer field season there. Um, and I will go back every year that I could until COVID hit, and then I'm back next summer. And this is why Petra was famous long before the days of the Nabataeans. Um, from most places in Petra, if you look in the distance to the south, you'll see a very high peak with a little tiny white building on it. That building is currently an, uh, an Islamic welly or a shrine, but before then it was a Christian chapel, before then it was a Roman temple. Um, it has a, a number of purposes um, because it is the burial site of Moses's brother Aaron. So when the 12 tribes are marching around, right, looking for a path to Zion, of course they split up, Moses will leave the tribes, Aaron will continue with them, will finally die, and he is buried in, in, on the, in the floor of this little uh, building that is up there now. Um, it's not an active mosque, it's actually a shrine of sorts, and most people are not allowed inside um, at all. We've been inside because we've actually crawled down into the tomb of Aaron, who is buried below the building, down a really creepy kind of a corridor, climbing down rocks. And he is buried, we think, under about three to five feet of candle wax from 4,000, 3,000 years of pilgrimage to the site. So it's really quite an important place. So this was a tourist attraction 1,200 years before there's any sort of Nabataean kingdom um, actively living, working um, throughout the area. So this is the view of Jebel Harun. It's actually a mountain on a mountain on a mountain. You can see there's sort of a large plateau. That's not the bottom of the mountain you're looking at in this picture. That's actually the top of the peak. And this is a separate little peak that's on the top. There's the welly. And here's the view outside of that little building. And the view is actually spectacular because it is the highest place around. It looks directly across to the Dead Sea, um, well into Israel. Um, almost up to the view, it almost goes up to Lebanon and Syria. It's really quite spectacular. So probably one of the greatest fallacies that I continue to read, especially in the older his, his, historian, historian pieces written, especially between the 1920s and 1950s, is that Petra was um, conquered by the Roman legions under Trajan between 104 and 106. There's no evidence at all that there was any conquest involved. What it looks like more and more, and many of the historians are coming, coming along with this, is that this was a client state that the empire wanted to absorb 
into the broader commerce of the Roman Empire. And so the Romans introduced coinage and language and said, if you want to work within the empire trading and selling, then you need to use our coins, the coin of the realm, and also use uh, Latin for your basic um, legal trade. And so that's exactly what happened. Nabataeans kept their imprint um, on culture, society, um, and then absorbed this little piece of Roman sort of corporate status. And so the two, from what we could tell, lived together pretty happily until Petra slowly fades from, from face and it love, Petra fades away with the incoming of Islam and a switching of the trade routes that um, bypassed Petra. So what happens though is Petra is more or less um, unknown to the West until 1812 when a Swiss geographer explorer named Johann Burkhardt um, has a hunch where Petra is he learns the dialects of the local Bedouins and feigns the sacrifice of a goat or a lamb at the summit of Jebel Harun. Um, he will write about it. It will be published in a series of articles, and then finally a book, but he won't ever realize the, the impact he has on his identification of Petra at the time because he will die from dysentery long before he understands the power of his book at the time. However, we also have to understand, we actually on the wall in my office, I have an original map from 1794 that is written in English and identifies Petra's location exactly. So Burkhardt didn't discover anything. He was already following a number of travelers that had visited and, and had spoken about Petra. He just published it in a much, in a larger, wider spread uh, media. And that would be um, both in London Times and across um, English speaking Europe um, at the time. He also publishes in German. So, but it's sad that he will never know what he did, good or bad. What's funny though, when he really fully, fully publishes his books in 1822, 10 years after his death of sorts, um, it's not hit by tourism like we would expect nowadays. It's actually, visited by a number of sort of esoteric Westerners, um, three of them very important artists at the time, Laborde, Belafonds, and later David Roberts, who's 10 years later. Uh, Lynette Belafonds is actually famous for something else that's widely overlooked. Bella, these are all um, sketches with gouaches, mostly some dry pen and gouaches. But what's interesting about Belafonds is Belafonds was also a cartographer and an illustrator who also mapped out the path of the Suez Canal that will open in 1869. So Belafonds is much more well known as the engineer or cartographer that will map the path of the Suez Canal. And his, it is one of, his, one of his maps that actually succeeds and becomes the path that is now what we consider the path of the Suez. However, 10 years later, another book is written by David Roberts, a, a Brit whose work at the time was, was considered really quite important. David Roberts painted, again, mostly dry points and some gouaches, mostly painted with um, a, an amazing level of accuracy. These are the royal tombs. We're gonna see the urn tomb and the Corinthian tomb, which you're looking at in this picture. This is the view of the urn tomb, which is this one right here. And what's amazing is the level of realism that David Roberts actually used for his sketch. Try either one, whichever one picks this up. Okay. okay, so let's keep going. And what we basically see though, is that we don't really see this concept of discovery. Um, in this case, I'm using the word discovery here rooted in reports and publishing. We don't really see much discovery occurring until the 1900s, about the turn of the century. Two men, Bruno and Dumaszewski, a Pole and an American, um, will identify and record every known object that they find in Petra that is hewn or worked. And so they identify more than 800 of these tomb facades and monuments across Petra. And the Bruno and Domaszewski numbers are used to this day. The B&D number for every one of these buildings you see are still used. 
uh, many of them have cute names like the obelisk tomb and the triclinium tomb, but we still go by often the B and D numbers for these. I think obelisk is B and D 411. And so we actually use these numbers where I, when we're identifying these tombs. Again, what's important is these are hewn directly from the sandstone. And this is going to lead us to a very important um, finding and work that we will ultimately do with a number of TV shows, most famous being the Nova special. What's interesting though, is everyone still refers to Bruno and Domaszewski and two men named Mangles and Irby. They still go back and talk about those four men talking, creating these early discoveries. However, I'm really excited to say that we actually kind of broke, broke that mold of, of, I don't know, what do you want to call it? Misogynistic legend, because actually the very first person to record Petra, both in writing, in maps, and in photographs, is actually Gertrude Bell. Hold on, I just stopped. We have photographs taken by Gertrude Bell in 1900 that very, very well chronicle um, the uh, Petra as it was at the time. Most of the photographs are now at the archive of Gertrude Bell at the University of Newcastle in the UK. However, a lot of these were discovered actually in the map vaults of the Explorers Club in New York City, including maps that the Newcastle archivists didn't know she ever did. We found her original maps um, of her work as a, a diplomat and an explorer at this time. So actually the very first person to really in the West to actually talk about Petra, publish it, um, not, I'm using the word discover here um, facetiously, um, was actually a woman, Gertrude Bell, who was really quite tough, very, very famous, and really instrumental in how we look at the Middle East and Arab culture, both good and bad. There's the treasury today. Um, in, in Arabic, it's called Khazneh, which is the treasury. We commonly call it the treasury. Treasury is a misnomer because they used to believe that urn at the top was filled with gold. People have climbed it on a number of occasions trying to break it open and it's just solid rock that's hewn from the cliff face. And you can see here how you have the cliff face on both sides and the building was actually carved directly out of the sandstone. Here's a view from above. And you can also see, I want you to notice this odd excavation right here with the cyclone fencing on top. About 10 to 15 years ago, we also discovered that there are structures, literally strip mall center shopping areas directly built below the Khazne that in a, in a series of catastrophic events, the sediments were so deep and thick, it clogged up and created a whole new plaza here that filled in this part of what was the city of Petra. And at that point, that is when they decided to carve the Khazne above it. And so there's a lot about Petra we're still trying to figure out. And one of them we do know is that catastrophic floods and this huge amount of sedimentation um, has covered a lot of Petra that we still need to uh, figure out, excavate. When you, when you go through Petra, and we'll look at different pictures in a minute, you go through a series of narrow canyons. One of them is called the Seat or the Defile, and it opens up into the main valley. And these are the royal tombs. There's the urn tomb you saw before by David Roberts. And these are the royal tombs, the Corinthian, the palace tomb, the silk tomb. Again, they all have b &D numbers, but we also like the cute names um, that we give to some of these but we're gonna go back to the beginning and walk in and to look at the research as this happens. So basically the city occupied anywhere between 20,000 at the low end to 50,000 at the high end. We think it comfortably had 30 to 40,000 residents and anywhere between a couple of thousand visitors um, at any one time. <laughs> it's a crossroads in an area that may, that that, that represents major pathways into Syria to the north and Damascus and into the south that would take us down along the border of the Red Sea with Egypt and on both sides and also on the side of what is now Saudi Arabia. And then it becomes an east-west crossroads as well because it takes us west into Ashkelon into Gaza and it takes us east into Karax, which is the modern city of Kuwait. 
um, which is also where Emperor Trajan will die um, a couple of years later after he um, creates this client status with Petra. There's the monastery, the picture you saw at the very beginning. And again, you really kind of lose a sense of scale until you see that there's a person, one of my students actually standing in the doorway, way, 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 way down there. So the scale of these structures is quite epic. It's quite monumental. This was an amazing engineering feat. So of course we need context. And this gives you an idea where Petra is. It's in that sort of southern western border of Jordan on the edge of Israel, just a little southeast of the, of the West Bank and Gaza. It's not too far from the edge of Egypt, that is the Sinai Peninsula. And again, it's not very far from Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. The scale of, these, of this area is actually very small. You can drive from southern Jordan at Aqaba down here, currently in a, in a highway, in a car. You can drive from this corner to this corner up here in an easy day with stops in the middle for shawarma and yummy food or something. It's not that the distances are not like we would think of in the US. So early on in the, in the early 90s, when I started to work there, I was surprised that there were no very, very good maps uh, constructed of Petra. So the first thing we did was we did very accurate maps using GPS and all kinds of satellite imagery to create digital elevation models. This is one of the first DEMs made of Petra in 1990, 1991. And it gives you an idea of how it's built. Here's the canyon called the Seek that takes you down. It hits a T right here, which is the Cosne or the Treasury. You go around the corner, here's a theater. Then all of a sudden it opens up into the main valley and here's the Royal Tombs. And all the water from all this area will drain through Petra and ultimately work its way down and drain here into the Wadi Araba, um, which is on the border with Israel. However, when I started to work there in the 1990s, none of us, I was looking at the deterioration of sandstone, mostly for UNESCO, the UN World Heritage Site Science, trying to figure out a way to deal with sandstone that weathers quickly. The problem is nothing really hinted at what would happen in the next couple of years. And that was tourism. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade at first didn't affect, affect tourism. We'll look at this in a minute because of issues involving war and intifada, all kinds of things were going on in the Middle East. But once those cleared up, the tourism in Petra has skyrocketed and it continues to do so. COVID slowed it down, but we finally, a couple of years ago, broke 1 million tourists a year in Petra. And this is disastrous until um, UNESCO and Jordan decide to deal with better sort of management of tourism in the valley and it's getting complicated. And you can see even in this picture just the number of people waiting to enter the treasury and I'll talk about in a little bit why those days are also gone. Um, the days that you could actually enter the treasury to go in and hang out and visit. So it was Hollywood and it kept going. It kept going. This is only a couple films that I've loaded here, listed here. And of course, most recently we saw Dune and Aladdin, both filmed um, in Petra or on the flanks of Petra. Dune now also being a new blockbuster, Dune 1. And so the right, the tourists keep coming. They're fascinated with this place. And it was listed a couple of years ago as one of the 10 most common bucket list locations internationally. People all over the world considered it a must visit site uh, before they die. So it's that's good. And of course, it's bad. My students always laugh that are doing, especially if those that are doing cultural heritage management, because I look at this as disastrous to the place. They look at it as job security. So I, I understand, right? It's good and bad. So here's these are these represent the latest data that um, I put together from the Department of Antiquities in Jordan. And you can see that we broke a million people in 2019, and then that plummeted with COVID and it went down to barely 300,000. Um, we were there for, I was there working, I was there for a three year Fulbright, and I was there working on the day from hell. This day, there was a day in April when we had, even though we had four 100,000 people that year. That April, we had 4,000 visitors to Petra in one day. 
um, that the, the carrying capacity of Petra can't handle it. You also have to remember that in, the, in those days, they only had five or six bathrooms. They now still only have 10 bathrooms. So you have 10 bathrooms, do the math, a million people a year, it, it's problematic right, in dealing with that many people in this little site. And it's not very far, it's only a couple miles across. So why Petra? Why have I always wanted to work there? Why do I love it so much? The most obvious things is there's no sandstone on earth that's this old and that looks like this. This is not a function of its deposition, like some people look at this and they consider these facies change and all. no, absolutely not. What you're looking at is a complicated issue called Lisegang banding, where minor heavy metals and different elements and compounds in the sandstone literally square dance over 500 million years. And they begin to accrete. The grays are mostly reduced iron. The reds are mostly oxidized irons. The yellows are sodium, there's a little nickel in there. So we start to get all these different colors together. And the structures that we love to work with are hewn, they're carved out of the rock, so they haven't been moved. So we don't have to worry about anyone having fiddled with them for 2000 years. Also, because it was part of a big oil exploration movement in the 50s and 60s, that the sandstone is very well documented because they were looking for oil. They never found it, but I'm thrilled that somebody did all the road work for me um, in advance. So I didn't have to do what we would call petrologic analysis to the degree that it's, it's already been done. So the sandstone of Petra is some of, it is the oldest exposed sandstone on earth. When we compare it to some of the American sandstones, when we think of the American Southwest, we're looking at sandstones that might be 50 to 150, 200 million years old. So this is the great grand dom of sandstones and these sandstones that, were, that are so famous in the American Southwest are simply uh, kind of filthy teenagers, right? And so this is amazing because it's a rock that has been around for 500 million years. For the geo geeks in the room, this rock is Cambrian and it's on, a pre, it's on the pre-Cambrian contact um, which is very, very unusual. So we see all of these swirly colors and ribbons um, having had 500 million years to move, move around and mobilize. An Italian chef visiting in 1920 wrote in his journal a wonderful statement that he has never been in a place that it was as lovely as Petra because it looked like salmon mousse with a mustard sauce followed by a delightful chocolate pudding. And so when you think of Petra's colors, it nails it. It really is right. Um, mustard, salmon, chocolate really kind of sums up the rock colors, when, especially when it's clean. And here's one of the few tombs that really doesn't show much weathering and deterioration. This is off limits to the public. It's called the Tomb of Colors. Um, too many tourists have been collecting rocks using screwdrivers and pen knives to pry things off. And so it's been closed to the public, but I wanted you to see what it looks like because it really is as ex extraordinary to see what the rock looks like when it's somewhat tidy and clean. So here's the five projects I'm gonna talk about tonight. We're gonna get going on this and I'm gonna go through these bit by bit. I'm gonna zoom through them, um, but we're really quite excited because they're actually changing what we know about Petra and both in theoretical levels and practical levels. And a lot of the Petra work we're doing actually is attached to international work in other areas, especially with sandstone work. So the first of these studies was the geekiest of all of them. That's part of my dissertation. And we used random number generators to create um, 350 sites in the theater of Petra, this theater. This theater seated anywhere between 10 and 15,000 spectators. And what happened was these randomly generated locations, we did all these measurements using laser level devices, and we came up with all these different numbers because we know what the dressing style looked like that the Nabataeans and the Romans used 2000 years ago. We can tell what dressed stone looked like and when it was Nabataean or Roman. We also know that structures like this theater were also slightly plastered 
and that plaster remains. We see plaster all over this theater. Over years, the plaster has turned brown, so sometimes it's hard to identify until you look at it up close. Uh, but it was probably a tinted or an off-white plaster at the time. And that would have been spectacular to go to an afternoon or evening performance and to sit in this lovely, you know, white um, stadium of sorts um, in the middle of Petra. So what this did is, first off, I'm going to talk to you just really quickly, make you all weathering nerds and experts on deterioration. This is true, not just about rock, but everything. I could be talking about food. I could be talking about your tires. I could be talking about your skin. So everything that involves deterioration is about the fight between what is intrinsic and what is extrinsic. So extrinsic weathering is stuff that isn't moving like sun or moisture. Intrinsic factors are things that either resist weathering or accelerate weathering. And then extrinsic erosion are things that involve moving that also cause it to deteriorate. Weathering and erosion are not synonymous. It's not the same thing. Weathering is what happens in situ and erosion is what happens through movement. So when you add these all up together, it's a way of looking at what is affecting the deterioration of anything. And this is what we use when we're looking at the deterioration of any kind of architecture, even if it's wood, plaster, glass, or plastic. And so what we ended up with all of these different variables, of course, with our research, this is the largest data set known. Um, uh, this is the largest data set known um, in weathering studies this kind of analysis, and this is loaned out, this is given to people all over the world all the time for even more number crunching. They love it. And so these are just some of the elements that the variables that were crunched in our work. And of course, we always have graphs. What we found out theoretically that's exciting is we tend to look at relationships like this, especially if you're using statistics. What we found out in Petra, a lot of our relationships are not linear, but were threshold responses or quantum responses like this. And this is exciting to us because one, it tells you that statistics can give you false, false results. But what it also tells us is that when something breaks down, it breaks down in steps and not an even, even process. And so what you're looking at is a threshold response or like quantum mechanics where energy goes to a point and then things stop. Energy creates a change and then it stops and so on. This actually has been published heavily um, in the Petra journals and the, and the stuff about Petra. And this is actually really important in the world of sort of theoretical sciences. We also found out some stuff that's super practical. We found out that in the parts of the theater that had iron components that exceeded 4%, which is not very much, which is the redder of the rocks, we literally had weathering in 2000 years move to zero. We literally have tool marks that the Romans and the Nabataeans made on stone. 2000 years ago, they still show the actual size of the teeth of the chisel tools that we used then. And this was extraordinary. And so we realized that iron as a component within the sandstone is really important in decreasing deterioration altogether. Something else popped up at this time, and I'm doing this work in the early 90s. We noticed a couple weird things. We did some old style mapping that isn't done much anymore. And since we've ended up doing these for a number of archeological sites around the world for large dig teams, and that is to create what we call horizon diagrams. So you can see the brown in the middle represents the theater, the layout of the theater, but the lighter yellow color around the edge here it represents the, the angle of the horizon when you're standing in the middle of the theater here on the stage. So you can see the cliff is very close to you here and the cliff is very, it's much farther from you over here. And so what's interesting though, is we noticed that the sun passed directly overhead and they had very specific angles um, during the marker years of the sun, equinoxes, solstices, and uh, both solstices and the equinox. That kind of um, pricked our ears and we kept digging and we kept finding more stuff. And you're gonna find, we found even more stuff than this. But what was interesting to us 
is that we realize that on the summer solstice, the longest day of the year, the sun left most of that theater by four or five o'clock at night. And so we're pretty sure the theater was covered with a sailcloth. Um, for large performances, because there are posts, there's indications that it was probably covered with cloth for some performances. But we also realized that by five o'clock, it is still sunny in Petra until eight or nine at night during the summer. And what's great is they could have held performances at five, six, and seven o'clock at night, well into the evening during the summer when there's no sun directly on you as a spectator visiting the theater, it would have been a delightful experience. Also, the sun is reflecting off the golden sandstone on all sides and illuminates the stage. It's crazy. So what this tells us is that we're not looking at a primitive society that was, um, that was enlightened by their Roman occupation. No, we're looking at a very sophisticated society that is not designing their city and architectures based on sort of arbitrary layouts, but actually very sophisticated engineering. And we're gonna see more of that in our work. So again, what happens though, like good science does in any sort of inquiry is more questions were arising um, from our more more questions were arising from our answers, and it wasn't it wasn't getting easier. More we had more things to wander wonder and ponder. So one of the things though that UNESCO and a lot of the restorers asked us, especially I, those that I've worked with at the University of Rome, was they wanted to know if we could create ranges for the recession of sandstone that we were finding in Petra, and we did, and we found out that basically one to two centimeters every thousand years on vertical surfaces was typical and two to seven centimeters was typical on horizontal surfaces. However, when iron comes into play, some of these numbers go down to almost zero. And so this, is, this was not the focus of our work, but it was a nice byproduct that people that are in the restoration fields wanted to know about. So we kept going and we realized that Petra has a number of surfaces that were dressed at known times. There are Nabataean quarry faces that were carved and hewn until about 100 AD. And then we have Roman faces that are quarried after that time. And what happens is Petra is filled with a number of quarries because what you and I see are the hewn structures, but until the earthquakes hit in the fourth, fifth and sixth century catastrophic earthquakes, most of Petra was actually stone and mortar structures. Those are gone, they're all collapsed, they're gone. But the, the Nabataeans and the Romans were quarrying that sandstone as building blocks um, like brick. And you can actually see the, the face of the quarry here, <coughs> and you can see the actual size of the brick that are being removed up here. And they're not, what's interesting is they're about the size of the cinder blocks, the concrete blocks you and I buy now at Home Depot or a lot of our structures are built from. There's also, 50 of these structures or more, they're monuments, they're called gin blocks. It has nothing to do with the genies, but these are these wonderful little um, monuments that are typically placed at entries and exits into the Valley of Petra itself. And so we think they're just kind of decorative markers that show people that, you know, look how good we are at carving rock, you know, come on into our city spend money in our bars, you know, buy whatever you need. And so these are representations we think of not just location, but also power and wealth. So these were great because if you look carefully, many of these are covered with these very distinctive honeycomb patterns. If you notice on this side in the shade, you can see that these were cylindrical engaged columns, but if you look on this side, they've deteriorated into all this honeycomb. And these faces are covered with this stuff. So we decided to look at knowing the age of these was between um, 1800 and 2000 years old, we started to look at Tifoni. This is what Tifoni is close up. It's called stone lace or honeycomb. And so we did really, um, innovative and elaborate laser measurements of all of these little pockets, looking at axes, dimension, width, depth, size, cluster, all volume, all of these things. And we started to crunch them. 
and we this is the level of intricacy that we got to when we were measuring these tifoni. And what happens is we started to measure them. On one cliff face alone, we measured 540 distinct cells of these, and these are the kind of numbers we found. What we found out in this work, and this work has grown into, we have measured thousands and thousands and thousands of these things. We have found that the greatest deterioration occurs on Eastern and Western faces and not on the South. And we realize it's because the South gets the hottest, but the South doesn't get the cycles of wetting and drying, freezing and thawing or heating and cooling like the East and the West does. So what we published a, a lot on this is that it's the cycles of heating and cooling, wetting and drying, blah, 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 that wear down the rock, not the extreme heat or the extreme cold, right? And so that's why places like Texas and Arkansas, our skin wears faster because of the cycles between heat and cold, much more than say people in Northern Canada that experience much more often cold or farther south when they experience much more often hot, right? Hot and moist. We all get wet and dry, hot and cold, and increasingly freezing and thawing. And of course, we realize now that that is, um, accelerates deterioration. However, having worked in the Mediterranean for decades now, there's a point that you realize that looking at the rocks is only a small part of something much bigger. And I think this is also what happens to us as you age, is you begin to look at things in a much more holistic manner. And so we started to do exactly that in Petra. And the obvious thing was first to look at what are tourists doing to this, to these tombs, especially the inside of the chambers. The work in the, in the Valley of the Kings and the Queens was starting in the 50s and 60s with tourism in Egypt. Um, and some of the work was really fundamental to our study that changes in moisture brought on by human respiration, perspiration, um, can be disastrous to tombs, like we've seen with King Tut's tomb in the Valley of the Kings. It's a bad thing. And this is reinforcing our work that it's the cycles of wetting and drying that are more important than keeping it all wet or keeping it all dry. And so we, deci we decided to start to measure the changes of humidity outside and inside these tomb chambers. We've done this for 12 years since, and it gets way more and more interesting. This is a photograph taken by, see, they're not facing the person taking the picture. My student took a picture of this because we are working inside the treasury at this time. And if you notice, there's a little cordon put up right here because these people don't realize that in a couple minutes, they're gonna to be told they cannot enter the treasury because not only because we're working there, because our research is proving that their respiration is disastrous to the deterioration of these tombs. And so the tombs have been closed since about 1910 because of a lot of the research. We didn't recommend the closing, but UNESCO and, the, and Jordan decided to do that. Here are some of the numbers. This is some of the early numbers from 1990. And you can see when the tourist numbers go from about 20 up to about 50, you can see what happens is we have these spikes in in, in relative humidity interior, some of these spikes we've seen to be 40% increases of relative humidity. This is a desert. And when you look at the outdoor humidity, you can see the humidity sits around 30%. And so there are times in some of the tomb chambers, we've seen the tomb in, in chamber humidities exceed 75 to 80%. They actually feel muggy from people huffing and puffing as they enter the tombs. We recommended creating tourist rotas where the people go in in groups and leave it air out between. And the Jordanian and UNESCO's just felt it was too complicated to do that and to oppose that burden. And so instead they just closed it. You can look in, but you cannot enter. We decided to look at the urn tomb too because it's the second most popular of the sites. And it's also twice as large. And we saw no differences at all. Here's the inside of the chamber, it's quite large. And in doing so, the same thing happened. We found all kinds of numbers changing with tourism um, visiting inside the chamber. And we kept recording outdoor ambient chamber 
um, outside temperatures and humidities to make sure there wasn't something odd happening in the weather. And so for sure, we saw changes in general, 10 to 30% relative humidity change was typical of a tourist group of about 20 to 25. We also decided to look at the deterioration proper inside the tomb chambers because tourists would not stand in the middle of the chambers. They'd all park their butt against the chamber walls and scrub it. So for about three or four weeks, we removed every grain of sand we could find within, this is inside the treasury. We removed every grain that was loose, swept it out and vacuumed it up, and then asked all of the tour guides to keep the tourists in this quarter of the chamber. We told them not to lean against the wall. We told them to tell their tour groups not to lean against the wall. They did anyway. They still refused. They were tired from walking. And what we found out that when we in extrapolated our work from a couple of weeks and looked at tourist numbers, because we have good visitor numbers from the Cosnet, at least in 1950. And what happens is we realize over a hundred year period, that lower piece of the wall that's only two meters high, if you look at that place, it's about a meter and a half by two meters wide. You can see seven square meters there. What happened was we saw a removal through abrasion, mostly from butts and feet, of about um, a half a cubic meter of material. That doesn't sound like much, but that's about seven five gallon buckets from Home Depot filled with sand. It's a lot of material. That was, that was removed from the wall. And this wall was carved 2000 years ago. It was Nabataean. And of course, that's you can see what's happened um, over time. And of course, we did all kinds of laser measurements. This is, what, this is an isoline wall map that shows you the actual um, recession occurred from butt abrasion and feet. The nice thing about work is when you find out that it's not just what you're doing that's exciting, but that other people contact you. And we found four very important um, sandstone sites, the Laysan Buddha right here, Valley of the Kings and Queens in Egypt, Mesa Verde in the US, and Angkor Wat in Cambodia, all are using our research for um, both restoration, conservation, preservation, and management. And then even Borobudur is talking to us, even though Borobudur is not sandstone, it's basalt, uh, but they're also talking to us. But the people that are doing a lot of work increasingly are those people at Angkor Wat, Priya Khan, um, these sites in Cambodia. Something else popped up after, when you've worked in a place for 30 years, after a while you study your hunches, right? And this was a good example of a hunch. On a mountaintop in the middle of Petra, some tourists go there, some do not, there's two obelisks. And if you notice what's odd about these is they're not constructed, they're hewn. They took a mountaintop and cut it down and left the two obelisks in place. They're not built, they, the rock was removed around it. And we would always go up there, it's a great view. We like to go up there. We would often go up there to eat. It's a really awful hike uphill, but it's great because you're away from the tourists. And we know the, the Bedouin family that own this little stand over here that always have pretty cold Pepsis and stuff. So we'd go over there, have our lunch, we'd bring them food and we'd go and hang out. Well, we happen to have um, Bruntons and laser rangefinders with us pretty much at any one time. And this is a group of five students. Here's the, the three guys in the group that are taking it easy. The two women in the group are working, of course. They're not in the picture. The, the three guys are kind of playing around, taking pictures. But we started to take measurements and we noticed something very strange. We noticed that the obelisks are lined up side by side at exactly 90 degrees north to 270 degrees north, both sides, exactly not with not plus or minus a couple degrees, but exactly true east and true west, exactly. So what happens is when you find objects that are east-west aligned, it usually has one very specific meaning, especially in, in ancient culture like this. It's used to identify the rising of the sun on the equinox because the equinox is how the year was usually divided. Not the way we divide the year now into four seasons, but divided between the autumnal equinox and the vernal equinox from the autumn 
to the spring. So the autumnal equinox is the beginning of the dark half of the year, and the spring equinox is the beginning of the light half of the year that was used for agriculture in the northern hemisphere. So east-west is a marker for us of, an, of a very, very simple type of calendar, but this site is also, we think, some sort of processional and worship site as well, because they carved the mountain down into very specific plaza on a mountaintop um, with these two obelisks. Also, if you notice here in the distance, that's Jebel Harun right there, straight across from us. They do not line up with Jebel Harun, which at first we thought was a no-brainer, because they do line up exactly east and west, which is really important for us. And that will lead us to all kinds of interesting ideas. And it started here. It started in the Corinthian tomb, and we noticed that some of these buildings in Petra are carved with very odd little windows that we call keyholes. And we've never been able to figure out, people have discussed these keyholes for decades and decades, and they've not been able to figure out while they're there. We had a hunch that it was related to solar marker days. We did all kinds of elaborate measurements. We went inside the tombs. It's also, these are also some of the most accurate in-chamber measurements that we know of, that we went in there with all kinds of, we love our laser toys, went in and measured all these tomb chambers. And we found out, this is, this was one of the first that we found out. We found out those keyholes, oh my God. On the back wall here, we thought these were small flowers. What we see here, we mark as glyptics are actually little suns. Then we realize on the equinox sunsets, the sun shines directly on the little solar glyptic in the back. And the same thing happens on the winter solstice over here with the glyptic. Then we said, well, wait, 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 wait. Why isn't anything here for the sun? And we real for the summer solstice. And we realized the sunset, the summer solstice is indeed this one that goes to the back of the chamber, but there's nothing there other than it shining into this niche. But, on the, but when you look at extensions of the Corinthian tomb, these are also, partly there. You can see there's the summer solstice, shines to a niche. Here's the equinox again, shines to a niche here, a little decorative uh, cavity. And then the winter solstice here, it shines exactly into the corner. And if you look at how wampus these tombs are carved, that's another indication that they were specifically trimmed and hewn to have another aspect other than being a space to bury the dead. Some of this work that we've found over the years is a little odd and tenuous. This is a keyhole that is inside the garden tomb. There's a little back room here. This area is this room. Back here, there's a second room. There's a keyhole back here. And it does, the equinox sunsets does shine in there, but it only shines into corners in this weird little thing. However, some of these are pay dirt. We hit a gold mine with the urn tomb. And we found, if you notice, the urn tomb has is also a little wonky on how it's arranged. And you can see it's been fiddled with over time. Sure enough, we found out that it is aligned exactly with the equinox on a perfect east-west, shines to a little knob on the wall back here. And on the summer solstice, it shines exactly to a ribbon in the corner. And the winter solstice, it shines to a, a ribbon in that corner as well. It's crazy. Also the doorway, if you look at the picture here, the doorway has a main portal, but also a large square above. And it's that square that shines on the back wall uh, also in the, in the urn tomb. And this is what it looks like. I am standing on the plaza in front of the urn tomb. And this is what your view would look like over the four marker days of the sun. And this is the second highest point in Petra here. Jebel Harun is off the picture over here. And it sets up here what is called Umo Biara. It sets in another unmarked um, structure, another unmarked uh, mountain here. And then the other one over here, this is the part of Wadi Sia. This is on the edge with the drainage to Israel. And it would look something like this. We wonder if, we know it originally had wooden doors. We also wonder if the doors had slits in them that would have made this even more um, obvious um, when the sun passed through over the year. 
Now, what you're looking at here, this weird apse that's been carved in the wall was, play, was put in here in the fourth and fifth century when it was also used as a Christian site. So those little niches weren't originally there. But if you notice up here, if I go back, up here, there is a very distinctive decorative bump up here. And there are two lines that are here that we think were specifically created to uh, frame the equinox sunlight. So again, here we're, we're slowly finishing up here, but what happens again, this is all about hunches. After having worked there for 30 years, a hunch kind of started to like seep into my head over time. And it involved the missing pavers on the street. This is the main road in Petra. This is the boulevard. This is their main thorough, throughway for shopping. And these were all, this was a large strip mall of shops in here. But these, these are oddly missing. And when we started to look at drone imagery, um, and at one point we had a balloon in Petra taking images, we started to notice something very distinctive and that the pavers in the street are missing in the shape of large meanders. So we know Petra is hit by bad floods. It's important to understand when you're talking about a place that's arid like Petra, we might get two, three, or four inches of rain a year. The problem is not that low of magnitude. The problem is in frequency. So the rain in Petra doesn't fall as drizzle all the time. It tends to come in episodic events to a couple times a year. So when it does rain in Petra, it rains in torrents. And so this is a photograph from 2017 that shows a flood that I'm stupid enough to um, experience getting wet with a student standing on a rock. And then what's going on on the other side, though, with me is, first off, when you work in Petra, and you, especially now with the life of cell phones, the archaeological teams, whether they're from Switzerland or the US or Germany, call me up and say, come by the site before you, you're done for the day, because we want to show you stuff. We need, you know, rock advice. And so this was a dig team from the University of Helsinki. And what they found as down here, these were occupied beds down here, we found coinage and sherds. Up here, right at the top, we also found a little bit of obvious evidence of occupation. But in the middle, we have two meters of antiseptic beds, classic flood deposit beds. The other thing that's odd is, notice the color, it's not red like the sandstone of Petra, it's a weird sort of beige color. And that beige color is only found at the outer, outside, way up north of Petra, um, outside of the valley. But it's a place where flood waters have been diverted over time into a side wadi or channel. Then if you go into records, 25 people died in 1963 in Petra from a flood event when a rainstorm not raining in Petra proper but rainstorm washed into the sea and killed 25 people, mangling them as the water rushed their bodies down that mile canyon. And so we started to look at this carefully. And the first thing we did was we mapped where the missing pavers were. And you can see here, they literally create a meander shape. They come and go. We started to look at it from the air. And what you're looking at here is literally that line we're looking at here um, represents where the pavers are missing. We started to reconstruct it. There's all kinds of ways in hydrology to reconstruct flood height based on the size, the amplitude or magnitude of meanders. And we realized the floodwaters in Petra probably exceeded five to six meters. We're now beginning to think that these numbers here, this is only in the last uh, couple of months, we think these numbers are correct, we think these numbers are too low. And we now think that the five or six meters also is true for this side, because the water is sloshing back and forth before it drains down to the border of the Wadi Araba. And so we've, we've had a number of trenches dug here to look at flood deposits here, 
where we can afford to have a trench dug. But what we ended up doing was we ended up realizing that, oh my God, these flood deposits are all over Petra if we go to look for them. And we have coinage above and below that help us identify the flood events as fourth to fifth century. This is what Petra looks like today from a drone. And this is what it would have looked like during that flood event. The water would have exceeded the plaza of the great temple of Amon, of, sorry, of, Jor of Petra. This great temple was excavated, in fact, by Martha Joukowsky and the Brown University team. And you can see that there's a broad plaza in front and a huge staircase, a huge uh, pronaos, propyleid right here that was magnificent. And that water would have broken that at about six meters. The water would have reached that high. So it's not coming through the seat, which is right here. The theater's here. There's the Roman tombs. That's coming through a back way where the Romans created a large, really sophisticated, and the Nabataeans sophisticated diversion system for flooding. Um, the problem was this was a very bad event. We also think that this event could have been a 1,000 or 5,000 year event. We also think it is following one of the great catastrophic earthquakes in Petra's history about 563, 573. These catastrophic earthquakes we think took down the dams that the Nabataeans built and in doing so it exacerbated this chance of a flood event soon after. And so this gives you an idea when you're up close how deep it is. This is a good 20 to 30 feet of rushing water. It probably lasted for a good couple of hours, if not a couple of days. Um, it raised the whole downtown of Petra. It wiped out this whole shopping area here. This whole area is, and this area right here was all occupied as well. This is city center, so no one's living here. The living area is up here and up in here, residential, but this would have been the hub of city center. This is Central Business District Petra um, 1700 years ago. So that's kind of the end of the research projects that we've been, we've been dealing with. What I want to finish with you is this. And I think this is the least, this is what I least expected as a professor working in the dirt with a lot of happy students, right? Um, I did not see this coming. And it first happened about 2009 when I was asked to do a Discovery Channel show on Petra and they kept building and building and building until February, 2015, I was asked to work with PBS and Arte France um, to create a PBS Nova special, writing the script, working on the maps, and choosing the, the specialists for the experts for the show. We weren't very happy with the specialists that we brought in, so I ended up becoming the, the voice, right, the head talking head on this special. It is since, it is, to this day, it is the most watched one hour of public broadcasting in the U.S., and we have recently broke 100 million viewers um, on this special. But I, no one kind of told me what to expect to be on TV. Being on TV for a short special is different. This has been all over the world um, and it still is shown widely. And what's great about this and what's unusual is I was asked by a publisher who is, uh, sorry, a producer who is a very wealthy Hollywood type if I had a blank check, what would I do to create a special of Petra that had never been seen before? Now, I had already done six or seven of these. And so he, I guess he thought he was talking to the right person. And I said, well, it's a crazy amount of money, but I have a hunch that Petra's tombs were carved from the top down. I said, history doesn't seem to indicate that. And a lot of uh, books discuss scaffolding that was used in an area where wood was very dear, right? And so I said, you know, I'm sorry, I'm too practical. I can't imagine this culture sacrificing wood for scaffolding when there's another method. So let's use Roman tools and carve our own facade. And the producer said, you're on, here's your check hire a team, we've got a year. And I went, okay, this sounds like fun. And if you notice here, there's an unfinished facade that's kind of reinforcing my idea that it's top-down carved. 
So Petra has more than 400 of these kind of tomb facades. Now in a city of 20, 30 or 40,000 people, 400 tombs still represent very rich people that could bury their dead or house them in these crypts of sorts. There's 400 of these and they all look a little similar with the same elements of a crow step, what's called a cavetto cornice. This is very golden, this is very fertile crescent, Babylonian, Assyrian. This is very Egyptian. This is called a cavetto cornice. The capitals are sort of Hellenistic, but what the Nabataeans will produce later, it gets even weirder. This entablature and this whole doorway with engaged columns is very Roman. Um, all of this layer, and then the whole thing is based on very much a golden rectangle. So we decided to create a prototype. So we went into AutoCAD and we started to create what we considered to be the non-existent prototype archetype of the wealthy Petra facade crypt. And the producer said, you're on. Okay, let's do it. I didn't realize I should have been more scared than I was. I was too dumb to realize how frightening this was. The problem is the Jordanians didn't want us to do it there unless we play, paid a crazy amount of money. And we couldn't do it obviously in Petra because it's a UNESCO site. There's a number of places we looked, but they were all protected. But in general, Jordan didn't want us to use even the same rock. And the problem is this rock is the oldest on earth. So we hit the ground running, looked at other sites. We went to Mash National Parks in the US, forget it. Obviously, we went to state parks, it's a no-no. We talked to tribal councils. We got close with tribal councils, but that got complicated. So this got crazy. So at one point at a meeting in LA, I said, I'm frustrated because I don't think we're gonna find a rock quite like that, that we can carve on public property. And one of the producers said, why are you talking about public property? And I said, what are you talking about? And he goes, I hate to tell you this, but I've made good money in Hollywood, blah, 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 blah. Um, and I own 3000 acres in a site that you mentioned. And there's a sandstone that pops up in the mountains above Santa, Santa Barbara. It's called the Sweetwater Formation. It's not as old as Petra at all, but it is petrologically almost identical. So I said, we have a rock that matches in everything except the age, but we're never gonna hit the age anyway. He said, you're on your own, go ahead. I'll give you whatever you want. I'll give you ATVs, I'll give you a team. So we did, we created a team. We went up there and looked at the sandstone. The problem is this is all of his property. He lives over there. He only owns 3000 acres at this property. The problem is these weren't big enough for us to carve. So we kept looking and we found this. Oh my God, we are excited. That's not me. That's Brad, that's one of the carvers involved. He is a stone sculptor, not a mason. So we hired both, my team was me, a sculptor and a mason. And the three of us got the job done. The problem is we had a year to get it done. We tried to get this done within three months. Um, we weren't even close. So what we realized is we could use Roman tools, but we couldn't write, when you use a chisel, you're using a large hammer called a mill to hammer that chisel. It was the hammering that was taking time, not the tools. So we had to give up using Roman hammers. We continued to use actually Roman tools. And then we brought in an air compressor. So all the air compressor did was made the hammer operate faster without us and so we used the same tools, but we had to trade the hammer for an air compressor. And we did get it done in three and a half to four months. So every weekend of my life for that time, between February and May of that year of 2015, yes, 2015, um, I flew, thank God we have direct flights in Arkansas. I flew directly to LA at Thursday night and flew back every Monday night um, on this on a similar flight, my students had no idea that I was working on a TV show in Santa Barbara, except I had the best tan in the world by the time that I was done, right? And I had the best California cuisine you could imagine. So yeah, they started to get a hint that something was up. We successfully carved a Nabataean facade using all of the elements and the style of the Nabataeans 2000 years ago. It got better and better 
and better. In this picture, we're still not done. We ended up digging deeper. We actually created a larger uh, tomb inside. We had more room than we thought. And this, this floor is, has been dropped since. And there's also a propylea large staircase that leads up carved out of stone to the facade. There's the original one in Petra. There's the 3D model from um, AutoCAD. There's the model imposed on our carving as it's going, as, it's, as we're going, heading, going out. Here we're, we're going back a little bit. Here you can see the air compressor, the little tube of air. There again, we're getting close. And there's my daughter at the time showing off new cowboy boots in the doorway for scale, right? And so it's still not done even in this picture, but it gives you an idea what's going on. We, it would produce Petra Lost City of Stone that premiered on, um, on PBS in the US and across Europe and Asia to 42 million people. And so what have we learned in Petra, both in my research, other than it's a, it's a crazy event filming on TV. We went back to the ideas that intrinsic and extrinsic influences are often overlooked when we talk about any kind of deterioration, especially stone architecture. Environmental factors and, sun, sun, and sunlight alone play underrated roles in influenced de deterioration. Now there's one worse factor we'll talk about in a minute. Effects of humans on stone decay and environmental de degradation are grossly underestimated and overlooked. We're excellent at a species at wrecking stuff. And it became even more obvious for um, us when working in Petra to see how quickly things are deteriorating. Earth-Sun relationships may have played a, played a much greater role in classical period architecture and urban morphology than we ever understood. And this is actually from Martha Joukowsky that I had to add to this. This was her insight that I, I heard this off and on because she would yell at a lot of her students you know, and say, listen to what, what, listen to what we're saying here, or listen to what's saying here. Her point was that when we look at science, it's often overlooked as supportive or collaborative with archaeology, even when it is contradictory of historic records. There are times in Petra that we think some of the science is a little contradictory to records, but then what it does is it reminds you of the perception that is attached and biased to record keeping and his, history. And so I'm always reminded by Martha here that con conventional analyses are often overlooked as supportive and collaborative, right? The field is huge, it's interdisciplinary, it's multidisciplinary. And what we learn from large teams when we're excavating and trying to uncover um, secrets or questions in the past are really important. So what's ahead for us in Petra? Oh my God, more decades of work. There's the royal tombs and my favorite four by four. Um, that four by four, my daughter has ridden that four by four, that donkey and his name is Michael Jackson. And I had to put him in the photograph for you. That's Michael Jackson, my friend. And here we are. So this is the monastery, the top of the monastery you saw earlier where those guys were climbing around and you can see how it's breaking already, but you can see um, for scale, how magnificent it is. And you're also looking at very, very distinctive architectural elements that are Nabataean. These are not Hellenistic. These weird knobs and these weird quarter flowers at the bottom are very distinctive of Nabataean styles, right? And so this is when we see the, the Hellenistic style of the treasury and the Nabataean style of the monastery. It's across town. So please, I'll disconnect from share and be more, I'm more than happy to hear to answer your questions. It's what I'm here for. This is my second home and a second love for me. So please. Steve, I see that you have a question. Can you unmute yourself and ask? And here I'll post, I'll post. Um, and no, I didn't have a question. I, somebody has your hand, has their hand raised, but it's not me. It says Eve's iPad Pro. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. I'm, That's all right. That's um, all right. Any questions for Dr. Paradise? Yes. Question. Can you hear me? Yes. I hear you great. Uh, I'm I'm wondering what is done now to protect the monuments from people climbing on them. 
Um, some are great and some are terrible. Um, a lot of policies have been enacted that I'm involved with. Um, I'm involved as a counselor of sorts for UNESCO. Um, I've written some world inscriptions, world site inscriptions, things like that. So I have a, a lot of, I've been active with pushing a lot of policies that keep people off the surfaces and give a certain power to the countries to enforce them. The problem is each country has a different way of looking at enforcement. In Jordan, a couple of years ago, a couple of Germans were rappelling down the front of the Kazne. And so they brought in what are called desert guards or desert police who shot at them. Good. So I had to, I mean, this is terrible to say. I was less worried about them getting hit and more worried about the front of the treasury. <laughs> Right. But, but that's, that's how they answered the question. They said, oh, come on, let's call the desert guards. Everybody has telephones now. So they called in the desert police. They shot in the air, but I was still worried that they were going to um, hit some of the structures. But policy is the best way to start. The other thing that I'm involved with is Petra has a museum currently that is now open to the public. And we just wrote their guidebook. It's a quite a large book that you get when you enter Petra. And I wrote the English version of the guidebook and it is filled with finger wagging about, about our collective custodianship, our stewardship. So we didn't word it like you're terrible for doing this. We worded it specifically in English to say, this is part of our global community. This is who we are and we need to protect and steward our places. Right, and so we're hoping that's going to help this summer with um, tourism because this is the peak tourism season right now. But COVID is still COVID is still an issue. But normally um, March, April, May is peak tourism, and then it hits again September, October, November when it's not summer hot or winter wet. So we're hoping that that guidebook is going to help. We're also requiring all all guides who are trained in Petra, you have to hire a proper licensed guide that the, lice, that the guides are also trained to specifically tell the tourists what's prohibited and what's not. So it's a tough one because each country, right, that's within UNESCO purview is still allowed to kind of deal with it as they wish, but at least we can give them policies that, um, you know, kind of protect it as best that we can. A another question. Uh, real quick. Hang on. Uh, oh, sorry. I, I see four other questions. So um, Glenn, and then I have three in the chat. And then um, Marianne, I'll come back to you. Why don't you do the others first? Mine's more geologic than archaeologic. OK. Um, so the first question in the chat is, do they know how long these tombs would have taken to carve in the period, to carve at that time? Yes, we figured that out and we're guesstimating between, for a simple archetype like ours, it probably took between one and two years. So if we kept going with hammers and chisels, it would have taken us, we think about 16 months. And that's three of us, two of us. They worked, they worked five, six days a week. I only worked a couple of days on the weekend. Um, so yes, that's a great question because we think we kind of answered that, but that's only the little facades that you saw. Something like the treasury or the monastery was probably generational. You probably had a family team working. It wasn't like the pyramids where you had, you know, thousands of people paid in beer, right, to, to haul rocks. Um, Petra, the Nabataeans definitely had this kind of style of working with generational expertise and we think that's how it would have been done right or a couple families working over a couple generations the second question on uh, the chat is um from jane why don't we hear anything about the nabataean culture today did the culture die out was it assimilated question. good question um DNA, DNA research, from what I've heard, new DNA research indicates that some of the Bedouin tribes, especially the Bedouls of Petra, have very distinctive signatures that are different than other groups, that we think that's kind of a, a little piece of their assimilation over time. 
the Nabataeans were, Petra is basically bypassed when the Islamic trade routes shift to the east. And in doing so, the Nabataeans will slowly merge into other active societies on both sides. Um, we don't hear much about it because we still don't know a lot. And I think a lot of the work done on them um, in the 20s and 30s is a little weird. It's, I'm not sure if it's, if it's accurate. Um, I find Jane Taylor's books the best. There was a woman named Jane Taylor who was the royal family historian and the, and the photographer of Jordan. She's, a, um, she's British, Scottish from St. Andrews. She, her books, two of her books, one is called Petra and the other one is called Petra and the Lost Kingdom of the Nabataeans are by far the best. Um, she's consulted me for years on her books. I've done a bunch of her maps. She's a real scholar and I think her books are the best. I just saw her Lost Kingdom of Petra um, in a books used for $14, which is a steal, which is a great price. So yeah, if you're going to read, there's a bunch of books out there, but they're more touristy. Her books are beautifully photographed, but she, her science and history is strong, personally. So That's great. And then um, did the Nabataeans ever produce their own coinage, or was it mostly all Roman coinage in use? Yes, they do. Um, they, it's terrible because it's often a Bedouin gift. When you work in Petra, the Bedouins will hand you a Nabataean coin as a gift, right? And you're always a little concerned, right? That they're, you know, these exist. They're very, very common. They're very, very famous. They have two lovely, there's a, um, a symmetrical wreath on the back of one side. And there's two profiles on the other, the obverse of the coin of the King Aretas. Um, these two profiles of he and his wife. There's a, a great deal of Nabataean coinage. It's a very heavy, heavy copper bronze. Copper was very, very um, common to them, just the other side of the wadi going down towards the cliffs, towards the border. Um, but yes, and the Nabataean coinage slowly fades away by, by the time 90 to about 110 um, AD when the Roman coinage becomes a part of their internet, their of more or less their their international commerce, right? But yes, there is there's a huge um, literature on Nabataean coinage, and it's very collectible. Um, it shows up at auctions all the time, Christie's, Sotheby's, Bonhams. I'm not sure how it pops up there, but I see a lot of coinage popping up um, in in public auctions like that. Glenn, your turn. Yeah, so about the sandstone, I've seen a lot of basal Cambrian sandstones around the world, and this doesn't look like one of them. Uh, but you said it was sitting on Precambrian basement. It is. It's, it's, it's famous because it sits on what's called the Black Mountain, and it's a basalt. It's a huge basalt complex that, that's Precambrian. What's interesting is this whole complex of Cambrio or Division sandstone sitting on top of basalt basement extends all the way into northern Saudi Arabia. So and the, is this all Aeolian? Um, no, that's interesting. The very white material that caps Petra is primarily Aeolian, dunal. The material that's farther down that's redder is a complicated interbraided fluvial, some dunal lenses, but mostly fluvial. And so some people used to think it was lacustrine, but it's, there's no indication that it was lacustrine at all. Uh, but the indications, it's filled with freshwater, not filled, but we find freshwater gastropods within the sandstone at the contact with the Cambrian, with the Precambrian. But so no it, sign of a, no sign of a transgressive strand sand. Not very much. And the weird thing is the DC sandstone, which is the dunal at the top, which is very white, and the Umishreen sandstone, which is the red one at the bottom, that contact, it almost looks like it's not continuous. It almost looks like there's a little break in time. It's been dated as a continuous contact, but the contact is too fresh. It's too nice. These beds too, though, are, are very, very horizontal. And so oddly horizontal. In, the, in a way that you would think that weathering and erosion would have peeled the top to a certain extent of the fluvial when you had the dunal transgression that occurs on the top of that. 
um, the problem is a lot of this was identified with oil petrologists over the years. And it's a little weird. They also call all of those colors facies changes. And when we look at that Lisagang banding, not even under great magnification, you see the facies changes, especially the dunal complexes. You see it, but the colors are almost unrelated to original right. deposition. Yeah. And has anyone done um, detrital zircon work on it? It's funny you said that because we have a faculty member in our department, Glenn Sharman, that's doing that's looking at that now. So I'm not sure. It could be months or years. I'm not sure. He's a new faculty member, but that's exactly what he's doing up here. So we'll see what happens. But no, it's a it's a weird sandstone because it's and we knew early on that you saw that it was less friable where it was there was a distinctive type of red where it's less friable and a distinctive kind of red where it's more friable. And then you notice those lenses in between that are bluish and gray are much more friable. The permeability coefficients don't change much. The whole thing is that permeable. I mean, it's, it's, it breathes when it rains. The water rushes out of the mm -hmm. cliff faces miles from the rainstorm. It's that permeable. But we've also learned something in Santa Barbara that we learned in Petra is that when the stone is excavated, if you go in about a meter or two and start to carve it, it's very soft. Once it's exposed, the moisture in the active porosity indurates the carbonate matrices. Some of the matrices are carbonate, some of them are silicious. So the sandstone, like the travertine of Rome, um, actually cut like pudding right out of the rock if it's deep enough. And once they're exposed for about six months to a year, it hardens up. And that's exactly what happened in Santa Barbara. Hmm. We played with Schmidt hammers and the stuff that was exposed a year later was whole orders harder than the material that we started to carve. And the color changed as well. Same thing in Petra. Huh. So does that help? That, that, that helps. It's Thanks. crazy. It's crazy, amazing stuff. So, Marianne, we're back to you. What was your follow up? Well, seeing seeing the environment be looking so much like desert, how could fifty thousand people live around there? Where did they get their food? How did they grow anything? Was everything from trading? They had extensive, they had extensive gardens, but I'm gonna leave part of that question to Dr. Hirschfeld because we just talked about that today. Right? Do you want to do you want to mention it, Nicole? Is this a quiz? Are you quizzing oh, me? Oh, I didn't even think of that. I didn't even think of that. Should I you want me to go? Go so, for it. <laughs> so Petra, so over the years I've mapped um, eight natural springs and more than 125 miles of subterranean and surface water channels. And those are water channels only for freshwater delivery. Now, add to those water channels a number of cisterns numbering between 30, 50, we're not even sure because we keep finding more cisterns. Petra was able to take those couple of inches of torrential rain a year, store it for peak summer months and feed water probably between 10 and 15 liters of water per person during the summer months. It was extraordinary engineering. If anything, the, the Romans learned from the Nabataeans about water engineering and hydraulics much more than the Nabataeans learned from the Romans. Because most, most of the hydraulic systems in Petra all predate Romans by centuries. So it was a really elaborate system of channels both bringing water in that's fresh water, settling ponds to keep sediments out, cisterns for fresh water storage, and then a redelivery system um, to the different city, to the different parts of the city. But it's a great question because if the city supported 20, 30, 40,000 people, how do you feed them? How do you get water to, um, how do you get water to them alone? And then how do you irrigate the gardens? And we know that there was enough food of sorts. We find palynologists are doing all kinds of work, uncovering all kinds of seeds and stuff around Petra, realizing there were whole whole terraces of fruit trees and vegetables. Thank you. Kay. 
Okay. I see one of them said, what's her- I, I had to unmute, sorry, I had to unmute, sorry. <laughs> um, so I uh, went to Amazon right away to look for the book that you said, Petra and the Lost Kingdom. Uh -huh. or, no, The Lost Kingdom of Petra. But that's there's a book, Petra and the Lost Kingdom of the Nabataeans that's by it. Jane Taylor. By is Jane that it? Taylor. That's it. Okay. Thank it's, you. Oh, it's ordered. Thank you. Thank you. How much is it new? Um, oh, hold on. Just a second. I gotta go back. Because I I I'm getting a used paper book for paperback for essentially 20. You can I, I think you can get a paperback for $25 new. That's 25. That's great. I mean, her book is amazing. It actually is. It actually has jokes in there too when you're reading her her book. She has a great sense of humor and she has worked there. She only moved back to London a couple of years ago, but she is probably 75. She's probably lived in Petra in Jordan 50 years. So, and I've had, the good, I've had the good luck of flying with her in helicopters, taking pictures for the Royal family. So that was kind of fun. She's delightful. Um, she's not only an amazing author, I'm joking with Nicole, she's also my daughter's godmother. So, you know, which is really okay. funny to me because it was just a weird coincidence. We were living in Rome at the time and, and we decided and our daughter was little, little, little thing. And Jane came forward. She goes, I would love, she's never been married. She goes, I would love to be the godmother. And she always gives gifts. She always, she's lived in Yemen. She's lived all over the world. And so our daughter gets all these cool clothes and things from around the planet. So but her book is delightful. She's won a number of awards for, and she has a smaller book just called Petra. By Jane Taylor. It's good. It's not as good as Lost Kingdom of the Nabataeans, which is a much amazing book. There are two related questions um, about the Nabataeans and their writing. Um, and were they Semitic speakers? Do we did they leave evidence of their language and script? Yes, absolutely. It it looks a little bit like, in fact, I said that said it today, it almost reminds me of dripping Arabic. Um, it has very, very long ascenders and descenders it has a, it's a very very long script and it's carved all over petra it's found on a number of um here let me take my let me get rid of this thing it's found on a number of tomb facades um it has a very distinctive appearance it's really lovely let me see if i can find this i realize i bet i can find one quickly because oh here we go let me pull this up for you here you can see let me share this Let's see, come on, Tom. I'm gonna to get rid of my slides. Share screen. Good question. There it is. So this is an inscription. This is, it almost looks like it's up, no, it's not. This is an inscription on the top of one of the tombs that actually says this is the tomb of the family of Turkmenia, blah, blah, blah. But this is really in good shape um, uh, and an incredible piece of, um, of script. And so we know we're able to, and I'm not, but I, I know philologists that are able to read Nabataeans. They're completely fluent in it. And it represents a Proto-Aramaic language um, that we still find writing all over. Um, about 10 or 15 years ago, my students and I found a large panel of script carved into the rock that's behind a large castor bean bush in the middle of nowhere out of Petra a couple of miles. And it turns out to be gossip. It turns out to be trash talking about another Nabataean about 2000 years ago. And that just made us laugh to no end that Right, that what we found, we were all excited that we found some important script and it turned out to be literally gossip about, you know, Ahmed um, doing something silly. And it was, a, and the script is, it's now uh, been recorded, laser, laser um, documented and all this stuff. But this is the one that I have, a friend of mine, Ziad took this picture, sent it to me because it's the best picture. He was up on a scaffolding when this was being uh, restored in part and took this great picture. So, and you can also see, if you notice this little tiny, if you notice these little tiny fine lines, that's actually, this is interesting, that's actually Roman dressing. That's not Nabataean dressing. The Romans dressed their stone with these little diagonals like this. The Nabataeans used a herringbone pattern. And so what they're telling us is that the person that dressed this building was, was Roman trained, but here it was made um, in Nabataean writing. 
for specifically for whatever this family was um, that was buried that it was interred in this in this tomb. I hope that helps. Fascinating. Okay. Absolutely fascinating. All right. Any more questions? This is your chance. <laughs> Thank you. I thank you so much, Tom. This is great. Oh. I will, I just put up the um Oh, I just put up the uh the um link to the archaeology YouTube channel and this I I don't know how quickly they do this, but this lecture will be posted there. Um so thank you so much um everybody appreciate it and and Tom is wonderful. My pleasure. Nicole, ask next time you teach engineering technology, give me a call. I'll do your Zoom for the class. That'd be fantastic. They really I'd love, it. I'd love it. It was delightful today. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. Bye. Thank you, Nicole. Bye. Right. I can help. Oh, yes. Wonderful. <laughs>